السلام علیکم خواتین و حضرات وسیم احسن ویلکم سی یو ٹو الیکشن نمبر نائن آف مارکیٹنگ فار نان پرافٹ آرگنائزیشن ایم کے ٹی سکس ٹو ایٹ ایٹ دا ورچوئل یونیورسٹی آف پاکستان وی گوئنگ ٹو گیٹ ان ٹو دا فرسٹ کمپوننٹ آف دا لیکچر وچ از گوئنگ ٹو بی آل اباؤٹ ایگزامپلس فرام دا ایریا آف مشن آبجیکٹوز اینڈ گولس وی آلریڈی ہیو ڈیولپڈ اے بیسک انڈرسٹینڈنگ آف دیز تھری ایلیمنٹس آف دی اسٹریٹجک پروسیس And today I'm going to talk about uh, the relationships that exist between these three elements in a way that we understand how these elements flow out of each other in a natural way. But we know that uh, it all starts with a purpose. The organization exists because it has a certain purpose at hand. And uh, fulfilling that purpose uh, marks the uh, completion of the strategic process and um, achievement of the mission. So how these three elements flow out of each other is going to be evident from the two examples that I'm going to give you, the one after the other. Let me start with the first one. You happen to be working for an organization that wants to be in the area of uh, alleviating hunger in a particular geographical area. Well, it goes without saying that this geographical area is um, not affluent. It deserves food which has to be offered to them either absolutely free of cost or maybe at subsidized, subsidized rates because you think that you have to maintain um, some level of self-dignity and self-worth of the target market and therefore you would like to sell food although at subsidized rates. Having said that, we should be clear about the purpose of the organization. But we have not yet understood or rather talked about the scope of operations. The scope of operations is going to be dependent on the purpose. If the purpose is to solicit food from other outfits that already are into the area of preparing food, then it is going to be the one set of circumstances. However, if the organization thinks it is going to prepare food by itself, it is going to be another set of circumstances. In either of the cases, the mission statement is going to be a little different because it is going to talk about scope of operations, which is going to uh, be different in either case. Going back to the case of a collection of food from those, those outfits that are into the, the business of preparing food, uh, let me tell you here that uh, there are examples of um, organizations that solicit food from restaurants on daily basis by collecting their leftovers, preserving those, and then distributing those among those who are needy and uh, who have to be fed on daily basis. Um, the organization is uh, supposed to uh, work out certain mechanics as to how to pick those families that uh, are deserving and uh, how the food is going to be distributed to those uh, the families comprising the target market. Um, and that is something that we should be part of the, the objectives first and then goals. But let me go back to the mission statement. Uh, depending on the scope of operations, whether you do it by yourself or you let somebody else do it and then collect it from them and then distribute to the target market is going to form the exact construction of the mission statement. And that is why I said I'm not going to construct the statement for you and I would rather like to leave it to your imagination and creativity because you are the one working for the NPO and you are the one who's going to decide um, what should be the real scope of operations. Now, this is not a question of uh, your whims or your fancies. This is a question, uh, what kind of resources you have? 
um, and uh, what level of capabilities and core competencies uh, you have, which will enable you to um, do the job which you, you want to do, the meaning either um, collecting food or preparing food. The point here is that the capabilities and core competencies have to be applied in a way that the resources that you have at your disposal could be optimized, could be uh, very finely capitalized on, and you get some kind of advantage out of the whole exercise. Uh, once you are clear about the scope of operations, it will go back into the mission statement and you will proceed accordingly. Now, the next question that you will have, how do you distribute that food? Well, you distribute that food either at stationary distribution points or through mobile network or a combination of both. Again, depending upon the resources that you have and the capabilities that you have. The next thing that uh, you must consider, um, and which goes without saying, is the product. Uh, you can have a couple of different uh, the products in, in, in shapes and forms. Uh, for example, you can have uh, food packets which you distribute at uh, the distribution points. And you also can uh, distribute meals for congregations of uh, the different sorts and kinds for different occasions. And if you allow me to go back to the purpose of the organization once again, um, you can um, get into uh, relationships with uh, those constituents uh, who are going to be the most relevant in terms of the purpose of the organization. In other words, if the purpose is to collect food, then you will uh, like to develop constituents who are the most relevant in terms of providing you with that kind of service. However, if the food is going to be prepared by the organization itself, uh, then you will be developing uh, different kinds of constituents. Uh, you may like to get in contact with uh, the growers of food or uh, the distributors of uh, prepared food uh, or food items and uh, wedding party caterers and any other constituent who you think can be of uh, a very high level of relevance to the service that you want to perform. So uh, you have seen that uh, you're going to have uh, the different options um, at your disposal in terms of uh, preparing the product and uh, in terms of distributing the same. Uh, you can have um, the solicitation model, uh, meaning you get food from somebody else and then distribute it or you get food from somebody else and also distribute it through somebody else. In the meaning, you get into um, an agreement with uh, another NPO that uh, specializes in uh, distribution services and uh, you decide for yourself uh, just to be an interface between those who prepare food and those who distribute food. You perform the function of an organization that identifies the target market and then make sure that food is collected on daily basis and distributed on daily basis very efficiently. The uh, next uh, the shape and form could be that uh, you prepare food and distribute it yourself, or you prepare food and have it distributed through somebody else. There could be so many different combinations, and uh, all these combinations are going to be a reflection of the mission of the organization. Or in other words, um, if you go back, and uh, try to uh, fit all this to the mission, they should fit very well into it. But once you are uh, clear about uh, the product, uh, the product source, uh, the distribution, and uh, the complete uh, scope of operations, you are all set to construct the mission statement. And uh, once you have uh, prepared it, you get down to defining the set of objectives which will define the strategic direction that your organization should take in order to move forward. In this particular case, what do you think are going to be the objectives? Well, the foremost objective would be to very strategically identify those constituents 
that who can be most relevant to the organization in terms of enabling you to be able to distribute food to the target market. Whether you solicit food from somebody else or you prepare it by yourself, the objective is going to uh, develop the relevant constituents with which um, could be restaurants and uh, wedding party caterers, like I said earlier, uh, in case you want to collect food from somebody else and uh, which could be growers and uh, manufacturers of food items and distributors of the same uh, so that uh, you can make things easy for you to start preparing food. And uh, the next objective uh, could be to get into a JV, meaning joint venture agreement with another NPO who you think should perform or could perform the distribution function better than your organization because it is not your expertise to get into distribution. Your resources, capabilities and core competencies do not reflect these kind of features and characteristics that you can undertake the job by yourself and therefore you would like to have another company that already is into uh, a similar business and uh, specializes in distribution networks. So you would like to get into um, a JV, uh, the mechanics for which you have to very smartly work out so that you can get into a collaborative relationship and develop synergies uh, for effective uh, distribution and marketing. Another uh, objective uh, would certainly be how you uh, put all these uh, connections together so that uh, the revenues uh, can be generated at a level that is uh, a prerequisite for the organization to sustain itself. You can also uh, think of uh, you know, a couple of more or, or a few more objectives uh, which you think provide you uh, with the strategic direction absolutely essential for your organization to move forward toward achievement of the mission. Now, once you have laid down all the objectives, you have to very sharply put together the goals which are going to be a translation into numbers of your objectives. So in other words, here you're going to talk in more certain terms. The goals for this organization would be in the first place to determine the number of families that form your target market. I think that has to be the starting point. Although I'm talking about this particular factor as part of goal specification and the goal determination, but the fact is that your whole business plan for the NPO starts with this particular point that you must know the size of your target market. Once you have identified the families, then you can translate that into the amount or the quantity of food that you require in order to feed them. Here, you'll have to work out the mechanics for identifying uh, the families that uh, are uh, your target market and uh, you can get into mechanics like uh, demographics in the first place. In other words, identifying families on the basis of their income distribution. Uh, for example, you might decide uh, for yourself that uh, you would not like to distribute food, whether free of cost or at subsidized rates, to those families that have less than five members and that have more than one earning member. Once you have um, these numbers based on demographics, you can get into your requirements of distribution because uh, without having um, information on the quantity of product that you need and uh, the size of the target market that you have, um, you, you cannot move ahead with uh, the distribution. So therefore, whether it is distribution of food packets at stationary distribution points or distribution of those packets at the doorsteps of your target market um, or through uh, a distribution network belonging to another NPO, all is going to depend on the total quantity that you are going to generate um, on daily basis and then weekly and then monthly basis. With this, uh, we are done with the first example of a food bank um, that has the mission to alleviate hunger in a particular geographical area. The reason I call it food bank is because you may like to uh, opt for uh, the uh, setup that uh, 
solicits food from other entities that already are into this business and uh, you're out to collect that food for further distribution and uh, you are basically performing the function of a food bank. So that's why I said this is an example of a food bank. Let us now uh, move on to the next example uh, which is going to further clarify uh, the, what uh, this concept is all about, the meaning, the mission, the objectives, and the goals. I know uh, that you already are quite clear about uh, how these elements uh, the work as part of the strategic process. They flow out of each other and they all start with the purpose of the organization. But still, I would like to give you another example because I really would like you to be very creative in terms of uh, the putting different uh, examples together the once you start developing a complete conceptual understanding of uh, the NPO environment. This example relates to a nursing home. You are working for that nursing home which provides medical and nursing care to elderly people in their latest years. Now, the intention here is that uh, you would like uh, your organization uh, to become an entity that differs from other organizations offering similar kind of services. You would like to differentiate uh, on uh, so many different counts, which are in addition to uh, just offering the boarding and lodging uh, with medical and nursing care to elderly people who may start thinking that uh, they are counting their days and waiting for the terminal point in their life to come and take them from here. That is not the case when it comes to your uh, thinking process and when it comes to your strategic process, to be more precise. You think by offering differentiation to the residents of your nursing home, you can uh, develop a facility which is second to none. And uh, you think it is not just the medical and nursing care, rather you must consider other factors like their uh, dietary habits and um, their uh, socializing needs and uh, their need to determine certain activities in relation to their hobby patterns and so on and so forth. The reason that you want to go for uh, these considerations is because you want to um, tell the residents of your facility that um, they are still relevant to the society and by offering uh, these services, in addition to the basics, run of the mill, medical and nursing care, you want to develop a sense of self-worth and dignity on part of the residents. And the unique selling proposition of your organization that has its roots in differentiation, the kind of differentiation I've just talked about, the meaning all those factors which come in addition to basic medical and nursing care. Once we are done with the mission, we are down to defining our objectives. Here in this particular situation, I think the foremost objective has to be hiring of the medical and nursing staff that are absolutely essential to keep the facility alive and to be able to provide the residents with the basic service for which the facility exists. In addition to that, we also need to have people who have the savvy for different kinds of social matters because as part of the mission and purpose of the organization, we did talk about giving consideration to the dietary habits of the residents, their socializing needs, and the need to self-determine the various kinds of activities. Like if somebody wants to get into gardening, the organization should be able to provide them with the requisite opportunity and so on and so forth. Therefore, we need to have people from different social uh, areas, the one being hospitality. So in other words, we need people who are uh, good at uh, the practices uh, from the area of uh, the hospitals, but also in addition, we need people who are uh, knowledgeable about the hospitality business. So in other words, we also can join hands with uh, hotels and restaurants uh, as part of um, some kind of uh, cost marketing a relationship whereby we can draw on their expertise, their knowledge, and their savvy for the different areas that we wish to, or we envision to put together as part of the organization's mission. The 
The thing here is that uh, we've got to put together all those uh, the steps and uh, the bring them into focus that are required to lay the base for our strategic movement toward achievement of the mission. And uh, that, of course, is going to take us toward uh, um, specifying goals. And uh, the foremost goal here also is the, the generation of funds, the revenue stream. That's something which is taken for granted. And uh, without that, uh, the goal, your plan cannot uh, be complete uh, in, in any sense. And uh, therefore, uh, take it for granted that uh, this goal always, uh, under any circumstances, has to be uh, talked about. Another goal could be specifying what kind of a relationship uh, you are going to have with uh, your partners, maybe as part of a cost-marketing relationship or maybe as uh, a short-lived uh, joint venture. Whatever is the case, you have to translate uh, all the, uh, the mechanisms um, into the financial terms and uh, into different numbers uh, so that uh, you can see you know, from day to day and from week to week and from month to month uh, where you stand and uh, uh, where you need to reach and um, what has been the performance at a given point in time and uh, what is left to be done and so on and so forth. Another goal uh, that could be the training and development of uh, the different uh, the staff members not just the, the doctors and nurses, but also specialists in different social matters, because uh, uh, training and development from time to time will keep them current with the latest uh, uh, trends. And uh, uh, by doing that, they can add a lot more value uh, to the concept that I'm talking about. We're now getting into the next component, which is uh, on culture. Culture basically is a set of uh, the values and beliefs held by the members of the organization. Culture becomes the guiding principle for people to move forward um, by harboring those values which are positive. And therefore, the greatest challenge in terms of inculcating a good culture in any organization, whether it be commercial or an NPO, is to standardize those the values and beliefs as much as possible. Okay, because the more okay, the people believe in good values and, and beliefs, the better off the organization it will be. So in other words, a large body of employees harboring positive values and beliefs will make their organization a good working place and a successful organization because they're a cohesive team. A good culture means that the team is cohesive and the team is cohesive because it um, has the commonality of uh, the values and beliefs. Like I said, organizations fail because they do not have good culture. They are successful because they have a strong culture. And all the successful organizations have a strong culture. The resources, capabilities, and core competencies uh, are uh, something uh, which also uh, evolve out of a good culture. And how does that happen? Well, I'm going to show it to you in a while. Back to cohesiveness. The more cohesive is a team, the better the organization is. It goes without saying. And the fact is, many good organizations exemplify a very decent and practical working uh, environment without having any policy manuals and uh, very well-structured systems and procedures only because they have a very strong culture. So in other words, people working for those organizations know what is to be done under any given set of circumstances. These people do not really have to refer back to any policy manuals or systems of procedures to seek guidance in order to complete a certain job under any set of circumstances. So culture plays a very important role toward making a setup either successful or unsuccessful. Now, this is not to say that uh, good organizations they should not have policy manuals and they, they should not have uh, well-structured systems and procedures. Um, before I start talking about the need for these factors, let me say here uh, how the culture of an NPO evolves. Uh, well, because NPOs are started by very passionate individuals, NPOs reflect their personalities. 
Culture development gets a head start and uh, everything that's done in the organization is uh, well intentioned and uh, people like to carry it forward with, uh, with a lot of zeal and enthusiasm of following the example of the leader or rather the founder of the organization. They still harbor the, the values and beliefs um, that uh, were demonstrated by the founder of the organization and uh, it becomes a way of life, a very strong culture which works day in and day out. And it keeps working for a number of years. The organization reaches a point when it really starts growing and it starts feeling the need of making a transition from the formative period to the period of further growth. So it becomes kind of a transition from one phase to another phase. And um, this brings in the need for making certain changes and certain adjustments uh, which uh, reflect uh, on the culture of the organization. And that is uh, something which is not really liked and approved uh, by the people who are working for the organization. Let us uh, call these people the existing uh, staff members of the organization. Why is it that uh, the need for uh, making certain changes is felt? Well, the growth of the organization has to be managed in a programmed way which calls for adaptation of the principles of competitive marketing management. So in other words, if we really believe in the concept of customer centeredness, this is the time when the customer or the target market has to be brought into a sharp focus. And the bringing the target market into a focus brings along with it a lot of changes that are reflected onto the culture, like I said earlier. The new entrants into the company who are hired mostly from the commercial sector because the organization now wants to have a customer focus are the more oriented toward the commercial way of working um, and have less knowledge of the way an NPO works. It becomes a very interesting kind of a situation which also presents itself as kind of a predicament because uh, the old people working for the organization um, are very satisfied with the way they are working because whatever they have done over the past years have been to the satisfaction of everyone. Uh, but the new entrants think that uh, there has to be um, a certain different way uh, so that they can make uh, this adaptations to the, uh, the management process of the organization in a way that uh, the target market gets the center stage. Here, I would like to point out that the reason uh, target market has not had a center stage until this point um, is that the NPO has been working very satisfactorily and uh, that owes basically to the fact that it started when there was no competition and uh, it was uh, mostly on its own and uh, a lot many different stakeholders did not really interfere or intervene uh, into their uh, working and uh, it grew to a certain point. But now you know, things have changed and customer has taken the center stage and therefore there's a need for making adaptations to the principles of competitive marketing management. And when that happens, the old group confronts the new group. The new group, you see, is the, is the, is the marketing uh, the expert group, so to say, and the older group is the one that believes in a very high level of social service, which is based on very serious and sincere intentions. This is not to say that the marketing people do not subscribe to that view. The only thing is that marketing people think that uh, the social service that the organization has been providing so far Okay, it has been very well intentioned, no question about that, but that has been done and achieved in disregard of so many uh, the different uh, principles and uh, parameters that we talk in relation to or in the context of competitive marketing. For example, um, the, the old people did not take care of the wastes. They the one, were not really concerned about a high level of efficiencies and productivity because they were only concerned about offering the social service regardless of the cost and regardless of uh, the implications of those costs um, on the future programs. 
And therefore, uh, the new the marketing people uh, think that they need to make certain adjustments all over to the organization structure, to the systems and procedures, and they think that everything has got to be institutionalized in order to make the working of the organization very much compliant with the uh, principles of not only competitive marketing management, but also overall management of organizations. And this is where the conflict between the old people and the new people starts. The conflict grows because uh, there's uh, the one school of thought that thinks that the new school of thought does not really have a commitment to the purpose, whereas the new people or the new school of thought thinks that the old one uh, does not really have a concept of the fit the, between the mission and the strategy. So this is the kind of uh, the conflict that brews, you know, and it keeps brewing until the point it is resolved uh, amicably either uh, between the two groups uh, through their own initiative or with the help of uh, intervention from the board of directors. Whatever the case is, it becomes extremely significant that differences are resolved and the organization is not only put back, you see, onto a healthy, positive track, but it also um, starts following some newer concepts in order to meet with um, future challenges. And um, that calls for um, conflict resolution, uh, which is um, brought about only when the one group uh, becomes subservient to the, uh, uh, the thoughts of the other group. Now, here you see that I'm not using the word subservient in, in, a, in a negative way. But what I'm trying to say is that uh, the one group gets convinced by the logic and the concept of working of the other group. If um, it becomes kind of a conflict of egos, the organization they will never go for the resolution of the conflict. And therefore, it is very important for the one group to listen to the other group in a way that their thoughts are subordinated to the ones they think are superior to theirs. And therefore, toward that resolution, they've got to answer the certain questions. And those questions relate to what exactly is the mission of the organization. So we are going back to the mission. I mean, if the mission is uh, provision of social service, at what cost? With what kind of efficiencies? And uh, with what kind of uh, results could which will bring the organization a better vision for the future years? So these are the kind of questions that they have to answer. And then they also have to look into the, what is wrong with the existing mission. Um, those people who think um, something should be added to the mission or something should be deducted from the mission, they've got to have very uh, logical and convincing uh, background and rationale you know, for that, so that the other party could convince itself that yes, that we have been missing this particular standpoint or perspective, and therefore that we should put our thoughts uh, in subordination to the, what they are saying. And uh, they have to look into the, what exactly the, should be the mission and uh, what kind of uh, adjustments uh, that should be made to uh, objectives and goals. Objectives are uh, the very strategic in nature and uh, the whole team, meaning the collection of uh, the old school of thought along with the new school of thought, have to uh, look into uh, which objectives uh, are going to uh, serve the purpose of the organization uh, better. And uh, once uh, there is agreement uh, on that, only then the resolution to the culture conflict or the culture shock uh, will take place. And the, the whole organization will start, will start talking about uh, not just uh, offering the social service based on very sincere intentions, uh, having good values and beliefs, but also in terms of how to uh, maintain very high efficiency, how to cut wastes, and how to be uh, very competitive because uh, we are at competitive market stage and uh, the competition uh, offers itself in so many different shapes and forms. And to tackle and manage all that, we need to have application of the principle, principles of competitive um, 
marketing management. We now get into a very interesting um, component of uh, the strategic process that are known as SWOT. Uh, we all know that SWOT basically stands for strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And uh, it really is a wonderful tool to analyze the two environments, the meaning the internal environment as well as the external environment of the organization the by way of taking count of for the strengths, the weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Uh, how do we ward off threats with the help of our strengths and uh, how do we exploit our strengths to seize uh, the various opportunities uh, is going to be the learning uh, of uh, this particular uh, component. Although uh, we all know uh, what SWOT is, uh, but uh, in uh, an NPO context, I think I need to talk about uh, the, uh, the basic elements that uh, must be considered before we carry out the two uh, requisite analyses. Well, uh, we know that uh, resolution of uh, any kind of uh, cultural conflict within the organization uh, has got to take place. And uh, once the conflict is uh, over and uh, we have a very cohesive team, uh, we are uh, all set to lay the ground for uh, the moving very strategically um, in terms of uh, applying our capabilities and core competencies and optimizing our resources uh, toward any program that is at hand. So in other words, uh, it, it, it again is the strong culture which uh, helps us uh, achieve all that. Before uh, we carry out uh, the SWOT analysis, uh, we uh, once again have to uh, understand the, the whole process uh, that uh, we have learned so far uh, with the help of uh, a graphical uh, presentation because that basically is going to form uh, the basis for uh, the internal analysis. And uh, internal analysis is all about uh, what is desired and therefore uh, we've got to be very clear about uh, uh, the fact to what extent uh, we are in a position to apply our capabilities and uh, the use uh, core competencies toward building uh, a competitive advantage. The ultimate objective of any organization, um, again, whether it be a commercial organization or an NPO, is to develop uh, a sustainable competitive advantage. And um, to do that, uh, we have to count on all those uh, concepts that uh, we have learned so far. But then to see that we need to develop certain connections and learn why those uh, are so much important in connection with each other. How um, the whole that is created by those uh, the factors coming together is greater than the sum of their parts. Let's take a look at uh, the graphical presentation and see uh, how the whole thing works. As you can see from the slide that the whole process starts with the strategic intent and this is something that I pointed out earlier also, but the strategic intent is a function of our resources, our capabilities and core competencies. And we've got to see to it that the capabilities and core competencies are applied in a way that resources could be optimized. Now, when I say this, I have to tell you that uh, there's a difference between capabilities and core competencies. This is something that we did not touch earlier. All capabilities are not core competencies because uh, those capabilities are also possessed by your competitors, the meaning other organizations operating in the similar area. And therefore, uh, those capabilities, however good and however up-to-date those may be, but those are not core competencies until the point you really can uh, create a differentiation, the meaning a point of differentiation, which cannot be copied by your competitors, which cannot be followed, even if they try, by your uh, the competitors. In the first place, it has got to be so distinct that your competitors do not even attempt to uh, the follow you until a certain point when they think they are ready to follow you. Here, you again have to come up with a combination of core competencies by making certain adjustments that you again come up with a certain level of differentiation with which sets you apart from your competitors. Now, we should be very clear about this fact that you can optimize your resources 
and uh, apply the capabilities and core competencies in the most uh, optimal way only if you have a very strong culture. And that is why I talked about the concept of culture and that is why it is so important because without a strong culture, there is absolutely no way that you really can have the differentiation that you desire to have and put in place and set yourself apart. A strong culture is going to enable you to achieve your goals. It is not how finally you define your strategic direction by putting together very fine objectives and specifying some very sharp goals. It is not that. They're not really going to help you until the time the organization has a very strong culture and the strong culture becomes a way of life in such a way that people work voluntarily as a natural behavior. So this is the beauty of a strong culture and this is the kind of contribution a strong culture makes towards your strategic intent and also building your core competencies. The core competencies cannot be built until the time that you have a strong culture. The team has got to be cohesive. They all have to be on the same page and rather on the same line in order for the organization to move forward. And it is only through that that uh, core competencies are going to be built with the help of certain uh, level of differentiation. Once you have built the core competencies, you are all set to develop your competitive advantage. And competitive advantage is something which should not be, or rather could not be copied by your competitors. And that is why you call it sustainable competitive advantage. There are certain conditions which make competitive advantage rather sustainable. And we've got to take a look at those conditions. The one is, as you can see from this slide, the valuable capabilities. In other words, you have to have capabilities which can ward off and neutralize threats in the external environment. If you have those capabilities, you are adding value to the organization. The next conditionality is uh, non-substitutable capabilities. These are the capabilities which do not really have uh, strategic equivalents. In other words, you develop these um, capabilities uh, through your uh, relationships with uh, all the stakeholders. In other words, you uh, develop a network of uh, constituents in a way that your competitors cannot see that. Uh, these capabilities are invisible uh, because uh, your uh, relationships are very sacred and uh, your uh, stakeholders and all the constituents, they trust you. Now, this is not something which you can show to your competitors. And again, it is not something which they can easily copy. And therefore, this becomes kind of a sustainable advantage for the organization. Another uh, dimension to this particular um, non-substitution is uh, the complexity of uh, the, the social relationships. The reason I call it uh, the socially complex relations because again, nobody can um, develop the relations the way you have developed because uh, there are certain dynamics which you follow and uh, those are the intangibles which uh, cannot be felt or seen by your competition. And that's why we call such capabilities as non-substitutable. The next conditionality is uh, rare capabilities. As the terminology suggests, these capabilities are rare in terms of uh, offering you the point of differentiation. And that is why we call them rare. Yet another uh, conditionality is uh, costly to imitate capabilities. Well, these are the capabilities which are extremely hard for the competition to follow or imitate because these basically stem from a historical perspective. You have a certain level of experience and you have the corporate memory and the corporate knowledge that you have developed over a certain period of time. And the way that you have done all that, it is not really possible for anybody else to follow that. And therefore, we call them costly to imitate capabilities. Once we have developed the understanding of this process, which basically is about building competitive advantage through strategic capabilities. We are all set to carry out the internal analysis of the organization because we are now in a position to build a competitive advantage with the help of very fine application of our capabilities and core competencies and um, an optimal ex exploitation of the resources that we have at our disposal. 
So once we are done with the internal analysis, because we know what are the strengths and what weaknesses are. And not uh, every company has strengths all the time. So talking about this uh, internal um, analysis and um, uh, developing the uh, competitive advantage does not mean that your organization will never have weaknesses. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, it is a question of uh, formulating the right strategies on the basis of these uh, strengths and weaknesses that you come up with uh, a beautiful analysis. Uh, so in other words, once you are done with the internal analysis, in terms of its strengths and weaknesses, where the objective, of course, is to find some competitive advantage. Because without that, you're going to have competitive parity. And if you have competitive parity, you're as good or as bad as competition. Because you do not really have something which cannot be imitated or which cannot be copied. Everything can be followed by them. They will imitate you, they will copy you, and you'll be as good as them. And that's what you call competitive parity. You've got to get out of that phase and get into competitive advantage. And that is why I'm rubbing in the point of competitive advantage and exploiting your strengths again and again. But at the same time, we all have weaknesses. Once done with the uh, internal analysis, the, the NPO is on to the external analysis, which is about the external environment. And uh, I did talk about in one of the components earlier uh, as to what really are the segments of the external environment. So having confidence that we all know what that environment is and what are those segments we are, uh, or rather should be, all set to carry out uh, the uh, analysis of the external environment and to determine what really are the threats and uh, what are the opportunities that the external environment offers. And uh, depending again on our strengths, we have to seize those opportunities. Here, the one thing uh, comes in addition to the segments of the external environment uh, in the context of uh, the NPOs, and that is that NPOs could have to deal with uh, a few external publics, okay, which uh, commercial organizations okay, they do not really have to. And okay, these uh, external uh, publics okay, have their input to make, um, important input to make, and therefore okay, we should uh, okay, take a quick look at uh, okay, what these uh, publics are. A public basically is uh, a group of people or organization or both whose needs in some way have to be served by the NPO. That is what you call a public. So let me take you to the slide and show you different publics that NPOs deal with. As you can see from this uh, presentation, the classification of uh, the publics is done into input publics, which consists of funders, donors, suppliers, and regulators. Then we have internal publics that consist of board of directors, the management, staff, volunteers. And the fact is that we have a pretty good understanding of all these publics. The only thing is we now have to put their roles into a proper perspective while we analyze the environment externally. And then we have the next publics, that is the partners. We have other NPOs. I have showed you with the help of examples. You may like to get into distribution joint venture with some organization that specializes in that. Then you have other corporations. You may like to get into cost marketing relationships. Then you have traders, you have government agencies. The fourth publics is classified as consuming publics, you know, customers, activists, and advocates. Well, these are the broad categories, and in one particular context, you can make further classifications and subclassifications. But the important thing about all this is that input publics, right on the top, supply resources that are utilized by the internal publics, which is the second stage, helped by the partners, which is the third stage, and consumed by the designated publics, that is the consuming publics. And that's where the target market lies. With this understanding, all I can say is that uh, we have laid the ground for carrying out the analysis, which is going to be about the four elements of it. Strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Uh, we can ask ourselves some very uh, pinpointed questions uh, on all these four elements and get the answers. The trick here is, uh, or rather the underlying condition here is, that uh, the management of the organization has got to be very honest and objective in carrying out the analysis so that it really can determine its strengths as well as weaknesses 
and seize upon the opportunities which the external environment offers. At the same time, it should be in a position to neutralize all those threats that the external environment carries in it. Thanks.